Buenos días a todos. Este, vamos a empezar eh, nuestro webinario. Eh, 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 hoy tenemos a Marcus Burnemeyer eh, de la Universidad de Princeton uh, como invitado especial. Eh, eh, quiero darle a todos este, un feliz Thanksgiving uh, a los que lo festean y a los que no lo festean también. Um, eh, es, eh, el webinario de hoy va a ser en, en, castilla, en, en inglés. Si necesitan uh, traducción simultánea, en la parte de abajo uh, de la el Zoom, pueden, um, pueden acceder a, a, a eso. Eh, desde ahora en adelante vamos a cambiar a inglés. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to the... Um, uh, welcome to another webinar uh, co-organized between MIT and uh, Universidad de Chile. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Um, I hope that you uh, stay safe and healthy and surrounded by your loved ones. Uh, a, a couple of rules uh, today. Uh, you can ask your questions either in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, Jose de Gregorio and I will, uh, will uh, 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 you know, if you ask them in Spanish, we will translate them. There's no problem at all. Uh, we will actually ask those questions uh, to Marcos uh, as we go through the uh, webinar. So let me pass the baton now to, to Jose de Gregorio to introduce Marcos uh, for today's uh, chat. Um, also, you can... Uh, Uh, watch the webinar uh, both in YouTube and uh, in and in and, in, um, and I think it's also on the radio. But anyway, uh, Jose de Gregorio will let us know. Thank you, Jose. All yours. Thank you very much. Solo una pequeña introducción en español. Sí, esto está siendo transmitido por YouTube de la FEN Facebook Live en, de, de la Universidad de Chile y por nuestro media partner Radio Cooperativa. En, en YouTube está saliendo en español también. But first of all, I, I would like to thank Marcus, Roberto, and Lee for his commitment with the region and participating in a webinar during Thanksgiving, uh, something that we are not celebrating here. So, so thanks and, and happy Thanksgiving to all of you and your families. Well, the, the turkey is in the oven already, Jose, so no problem. <laughs> So we have the honor and the pleasure to have a good friend, Marcus Brunemeyer, a great economist and academic. We have learned a lot from him. Marcus is the Edward Sanford Professor at Princeton University. He's a faculty member of the Department of Economics and director of Princeton's Benheim Center for Finance. He's also research associate at the NBR, CPR, and the CIFO, and also is a member of the Bellagio Group on the International Economy. He's a Sloan Fellow, Research Fellow, Fellow of the Econometric Society, Guggenheim Fellow, and the recipient of the Bernasser Prize Grant for Outstanding Contributions in the Fields of Macroeconomics and Finance. He is and has been member of several advisory groups, including the IMF, Federal Reserve of New York, the Euro System, the, the Euro Systemic Risk Board, the Bundesbank, the US Congressional Budget Office. Marcus was a, got his PhD from the London School of Economics. His research focuses on international financial markets and the macroeconomy, with special emphasis on bubbles, liquidity, financial, and monetary stability. And to explore these topics, he always incorporates frictions as well as behavioral elements. He has written five books, published a large number of path-breaking papers. He has been awarded several best paper prizes and serve on the editorial board of several leading economics and finance journals. He has tried to establish the concept of liquidity spirals, covert systemic risk measure, the volatility paradox, paradox of prudence, ESD, IS, financial dominance, receiving monetary policy, and a lot more, and also in, in the digital currency area. This year, Marcus has organized it very interesting webinars at Princeton University, where his introductions have been remarkable. And today, he will talk about lessons he has learned from this great initiative. So Marcus, I cannot say the floor is yours. The screen is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Jose and Roberto, and for the whole team for setting these things up. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody as well, for the whole audience. It's a pleasure to be here and to be in uh, Latin America and beyond 
And as uh, Jose mentioned, I will talk about what I have learned from the webinar series I've organized. And um, I have drawn 19 lessons, but I will, won't cover all of them. The last lesson is that I'm still learning. Um, but you know, if you ask me what is the word of the year of 2020, it's probably COVID, but the second one, I would like to nominate the second word is resilience. And I would like to focus on resilience today in my uh, remarks. In particular, I would like to say we have to rethink our social contract and a big emphasis should be spent on resilience. And before I say this, I should say what is actually resilience? And that's what I would like to start out with. And we talk a lot in uh, finance and in economics, we talk about risks. And the risk, you know, we have a whole field of risk management and it's all about, you know, variants. Uh, you know, if they're fat tails, there's also tail risk analysis. So that's what we have. And we try to squeeze and reduce the risk we are facing. Resilience is something different. Resilience is not that you essentially avoid any shock you might be facing, but it is that you actually come back to it. So that's essentially, instead of having the variance focused on the variance, you focus much more on the mean reversion. So that's what I would like to emphasize on. It's more like how easily you can bounce back. So you're not avoid any risk. You might take on risks, but you would like to have some resilience. Once you're faced with it, you can bounce back. And you know, there's this roly poly toy in Germany, we say Stier auf Männchen, a man who always gets up. So if you push him over, he will come back up. And that's, I think, what I refer to as resilience is somebody who is, when he gets hit, he is actually coming back up. So an alternative picture you can actually draw is essentially rather than squeezing the process between two concrete walls and you, you manage, you make the area smaller and smaller in order to reduce the variance, you have actually a rubber wall. You bounce against the rubber wall, then it bounces back. So it's like a little bit like a trampoline. <clears throat> Phenomenon, but I think that instead of mathematically, instead of focusing on variance, uh, one should be focusing much more on uh, mean reversion components. So let me then uh, say something about uh, the tail risk. So I mentioned the tail risk we will focus on, especially if you have fat tails in the distribution. And the alternative is a trap avoidance analysis. And I just, you know, I proposed for the ECB that to review the monetary. Uh, analysis at the moment to focus on the trap avoidance analysis. You don't want to be trapped. So it's fine if you face a tail risk, if you come back, uh, that's essentially fine, but you don't want to be trapped. So you don't want to be trapped in a deflationary trap or inflationary trap. Either way is actually dangerous. And that's where the trap avoidance analysis comes in. So rather than focusing on variance, let's focus on mean, rev rev uh, uh, mean reversion and tail risk is still important. I'm not dismissing that, but let's focus more on trap avoidance. And once you have a tail risk realization, how easily is it to, to come back? Now, let me, so with this in mind, I will lend, now go to a bigger picture and say, okay, how should we redesign the social contract in society? And how I got to this is essentially by listening to Trevor Noah's and he discussed the social contract in a very, very vivid way at some of his, um, interviews, I mean, it, it was not an interview with himself. And uh, that got me thinking about the social contract. But before I go this, he got to that because the COVID crisis really made clear what's wrong in our society. What are the big challenges and what Warren Buffett called the naked swimmer moment. Okay, so when the water gets out in the tide, then all the weaknesses in our societies are revealed. And what were these weaknesses? His weaknesses were a lot of health externalities. So we didn't have universal health care in the United States. There was very little sick leave. So people had to go back to work. And then because they were forced essentially back going back to work in order to make ends meet, they were infecting others. So having no sick leave is actually a huge externality on others. And you also saw a huge death rate much higher in minorities rather than uh, in, in, the, in the majority. So there were some things which became very prominent through the COVID crisis. So the first thing is the COVID crisis really made the weaknesses of our systems very, very clear. And now we have to work on them to improve upon them. The other element of the COVID crisis is that it acted as a trend accelerator. So that's essentially what I have my little bicycle here. So you go down the trend, that was the path. If you think about you know, home office, if you think about many, many aspects, 
globalization uh, retrenching. There was a trend going there, but the COVID crisis made everything much faster. So there was a trend accelerator and there's an optimal speed to keep a stable social society, a social contract. If things go too fast, but then actually it's hard to manage. Uh, so for example, you know, a classic example is in Germany where you had all the coal miners and at some point, uh, you know, you have to close down the coal mines, but you slowly close them down because people have built human coal miners, they have built human capital and you slowly close them down, routing, closing down everything in one shot. So there's an optimal speed. If you do it too slow, you, you, grow, you reduce growth, that's not good. If you do it too fast and disruptions are too fast and people are afraid of disruptions at the point, that's also problematic because people get too risk averse uh, and then it's problematic. So let me come to a social contract and I want to give you the social contract a more an economic spin. Okay, so that's, uh, of course it comes from political science and philosophy, but I would like to give it an economic spin. So going back to Tom, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, of course they all have focused very much on the social contract. They had very different interpretation about the social contract. And the one I will start out with is the state of nature where we start out with uh, I would like to start out with Tom Hobbes because that's the closest to the homo economicus in economics. Essentially, he argues that, as you know, that if people live on their own and if there are no rules and if there's nothing uh, fixed by a social contract, we can just steal from each other as we want. We can just, you know, if it's maximizing our utility, we kill the neighbor or we just steal his car, whatever it is. And the same thing is we don't have to take care of the other's health either. No, I can just go with, even though I'm sick, I can go to work and uh, infect others because I don't internalize the externalities. And this way, I would like to interpret the social contract as driven from externalities to manage externalities. Okay, so that's essentially where I get the economic interpretation of uh, Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. Of course, Locke and Rousseau had a different interpretation. They were much had a much more, more positive picture of human beings. But let me stick with it, Tom Hawks, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes uh, interpretation for now. And then I will come back to the others uh, later on. So here's what the social contract, how does society come together? And we implicitly agree to that. And one is essentially to limit externalities from others. So we limit how many externalities we can impose on others. That's what the social contract does. And it's the externality interpretation. That's one component of the social contract. The other component of the social contract is that we also have externalities from mother nature. That's how I interpret shocks. Now that's a shock. We have a COVID shock, that's a shock, but we have a lot of idiosyncratic risk and idiosyncratic shocks. And we might have a society where we ensure each other against these idiosyncratic shocks, which are externalities from nature. That's my interpretation in order to fit everything in the externality interpretation. And then of course, John Rawls and the Wilden of Ignorance and all this you're all familiar with. But what's the difference to an insurance and providing resilience? Insurance just means I compensate you for your losses, while resilience means I give you the ability to get out of your hole you fell into. Okay, so I put down a ladder and you walk out of it. And I think that's very, very important in my view that you have, to, you have to do it on your own, but somebody gives you some support to be able to do it. And of course, there's some illusion of control element to it, but you feel much more dignity and you, it also limits the moral hazard from the insurance contract ex ante. But I think the dignity that you were suffering some setbacks but you made it back, uh, that's a huge reward, which a physical just paying makes some payment doesn't give you. And that's, I think, why I would like to focus on the resilience and making people more resilient rather than just giving money away, uh, making them more resilient that they can on their own with the help of others because you put the ladder into the hole and they can get out of the hole again. Uh, is actually, that's the that's philosophy uh, from which I would like to, to see this and then see how things uh, play together. So let me go a little bit back to resiliency. What makes a society more resilient or less resilient in a way? And I would like to draw a little bit from uh, Mother Nature again and draw some analogies uh, and also some other economic research which points uh, to this picture. So one is diversity. So how diverse a society do you want to have? And we know so on the one hand 
you know, you have, if you have a monoculture, so it's here, I've drawn here some trees, they're all identical. And then there's one particular bug or insect, and then it wipes out the whole monoculture. So if you don't have diversity, you are very non-resilient in a sense, because if there is a particular shock, it wipes out the whole thing. So, and it's also the case, any shock is a symmetric shock. If we're all the same, if we focus on one particular industry as a country, and if we don't have a diversified industry in the country, but then there's a particular shock and then our economy is wiped out. The well, same thing is true for a forest, which is based on monoculture. So you would like to have some diversity. So there's an optimal, there's, there's a push for diversity. That's a force towards diversity because the shocks become then more idiosyncratic rather than a systematic or symmetric in a sense. It's not done. And you would like to go for diversity in this sense. So that's one force which pushes, you know, diverse economies or systems more generally uh, are more robust and more resilient. The second aspect I would like to emphasize, and that goes back to Alessino, who unfortunately, Alberto Alessino, unfortunately died this uh, May. Um, uh, that is what he argues that if the society is very heterogeneous, so there's a lot of benefit from diversity, the willingness to insure each other is actually reduced. So he argued that in the US, the effect that there is less uh, social insurance in the US compared to the many European countries, pick a particular one, Sweden or the Nordic countries, where it's a very homogeneous society. Uh, that's the case that, uh, uh, you know, there's way more willingness to have some social insurance programs and all so forth. So then there's an optimal degree of diversity. How much homogeneity do you want to have? On the one hand, if you're too homogeneous, yeah, any shock is, an as, is, a, is a symmetric shock. If you are too heterogeneous, you might not be willing to provide the insurance. So that's essentially how society, and of course, it has implications for, for many things, immigration policy and so forth. Now, the other thing is you would like to have a system or an economy which is very flexible. It's not stuck. In, in a particular direction and can re-optimize very easily, is agile. And that's, you know, I pick here a tree, there's some windstorm and the tree is just moving over there. And if the wind comes from the other side, the tree will move the other direction. And the third element I think which is important for resilience is what I call the bicycle analogy. So here's my little bicycle and uh, the bicycle, you can drive this bicycle and then there will be winds, side winds coming from left or right, you don't know, and it throws over the bicycle. And it's the same thing. If the bicycle goes at the right speed, then you can actually withstand the side winds. But if you go too slowly, then actually winds from the sides will throw you over. So what you need is actually you need a healthy growth in the economy in order to easily sustain uh, the social contract so that everybody's happy because you have then some winners. You can take away because of some endowment effect. You can take away more from the guys who take some winners and distribute it to the, the losers. So if, but if the economy is stagnant, then it's very hard to manage that. And that I put it in the sentence, a social contract that boosts inclusive growth stabilizes the social contract. So it's you know, a social contract, which is designed for a productive, innovative economy is actually better in the long run for uh, the uh, social contract because it stabilizes, it allows some form of redistribution if it's done a well. So that's about uh, the, the elements which help me to help one to have more resilience. Now, the next question is how to implement a social contract. And perhaps I'm giving a little bit of an economics lecture, but the first part is new and that's what I was puzzled a lot and that gave me to this uh, solution. So how do you implement a social contract? And you know, you can, of course, the government can implement it. They can actually enforce rules, government command the control rules. They can impose taxes and subsidies, a stick and carrots, the Guvian taxes and so forth. But I think if you think about it, a lot of the social contract is just implemented by social norms. So, and the way I think about what's very classic here uh, Asian countries do way better in managing the COVID crisis. And you might say, okay, they are, you know, have no privacy, surveillance is everywhere in China. You know, if you have your iPhone, if you want to go into a building, you have to use your iPhone or your smartphone. And, you know, they know everywhere where you are and, and there's actually no privacy. But the big puzzle in my view, what's really illuminating for me, I was thinking a lot about is Japan. Japan has very little uh, on force enforced rules by the government, okay? And they're doing phenomenally well and they have 
almost no lockdown and is doing very well. And it's, I think it's because of the social norms in Japan. Of course, it was always tradition to wear a mask, but it is also a society where you're very considerate to your neighbors. And it's a very homogeneous society. So you care a lot about your neighbors, but the social pressure to care what your neighbors think about you is extremely high. So I think the social norms in economic research is totally unemphasized. Of course, George, Ak George Akalov and others have worked on that. But you know, this is really the key uh, to figure out why in the Asian countries things are going so well. Of course, there's a technological aspect to it. If you look at Korea, Taiwan, and other countries, but if you look at Japan, there's no technological technology they are using uh, compared what what in the West is used. And that's very, very insightful. And it's very, very, I think we should study this much more. And that's one way to implement this social contract is purely by social norms and certain social identities, a sense of community. And for this, it helps to have a homogeneous society again, to be part of the same society. Now, of course, command and control is another way to implement it, but it has its limits. You can't go in somebody's living room to check how many people are there and all this during Thanksgiving. Uh, that's you know, very controversial and it comes with a loss of privacy. And that's a big topic as well. I think that's, we have to work on the privacy. I'm very interested in the privacy issues also in connection with money. You know, cash is a, is a way to maintain privacy. If you go to digital forms of payments, privacy is lost, so the surveillance. And if you look historically, as a German, we're very concerned about privacy issues, you know, looking back to the Gestapo on the, during the Nazi regime and uh, looking at the Stasi during the communistic regime in East Germany. That's a very hot issue uh, to consider in Germany in particular, but in general, I think it's something uh, to take account. Of course, in many, many Asian countries, that's not of such a big concern. Again, it matters, you know, if the economy is growing fast, then, you know, probably have more trust in, in your government as well. And then the third way to implement this, of course, to, through markets, we're all familiar with that. And I just want to uh, mention some aspects. Of course, we have information aggregation works much better in markets. Uh, there's, of course, larger growth, which enhances then the social contract. But we have explicit insurance contracts. But the, one of the big ones is limited liability. So you have this bankruptcy protection, which is like, you know, it limits the downside risk. If you start a company or if you go into private bankruptcy, there's a downside risk protection. That's part of our social contract that you can actually default on debt. So debt has an insurance component to it. And I think that's very, very important part, as part of the social contract, as part of the resilience focus of the social contract. Again, how easily can get it out? I made a mistake. Uh, my debt is wiped out and I can start over again. That's huge resiliency. That leads to higher growth, as I mentioned, and it stabilizes then the social contract. More generally, the big question I think we are facing is that uh, you know, on the, on the line between authoritarian regime and an open society, so I put here Stalin and uh, F.A. Hayek on this uh, dimension. If you think what's welfare maximizing, here's my welfare maximizing point. So there's there's some externalities. So you want to have some government involvement and all that. And now with the health externalities, of course, the welfare, everything is getting worse because we have COVID. So the welfare is lower, but the optimal point is also shifting away from an open society, more to authoritarian uh, society. And the big question we will face as a society, will we move back once the COVID crisis is, is gone? And that there's a, uh, so I should say I'm, I'm working on a, on a little booklet on this and hopefully I will come out with this in the next few weeks. And uh, there's, of course, the big question is, you know, will we come back uh, to uh, a society which, you know, will be closer to the open society rather than authoritarian society with surveillance and so forth and protect our privacy. And one example, for example, is if you think about the speed limit in the United States, it was implemented in the 70s because of the oil price shock, but the speed limit stayed. Okay, so often it's the case there's a shock, the regulation is changing, but then the shock, the reason for the shock is going away. Oil price came down, is at record low pretty much, and but the speed limit is still around we are having, okay? Now, let me move on a little bit. So, of course, this is not the big pictures. Now, move a little bit to more smaller issues. I mean, there's still huge macroeconomic issues. But what actually affects people's behavior? Will they do social distancing? And I noticed a huge difference between the first wave and the second wave. 
The first wave, I would argue, was driven by fear. This COVID fear was driving the behavior. It was not really regulation. So if you look there, the famous example, Sweden went for this herd immunity strategy initially, and Denmark and other Nordic countries went, you know, for the traditional, you know, lockdown and all that. There was no big difference in terms of the economic performance. Of course, Sweden did worse in terms of health performance, but economic performance didn't do much. But I think more cleaner studies are done by Raj Chetty and his team and Gulsby and Syverson, who have studied as Wisconsin versus Minnesota. In one, there was a lockdown. In the other one, there was less of a lockdown. And nevertheless, the activity in both states was the same. So it's very clean. There's essentially only a river which divides both states. And you can see that there's almost no difference um, between uh, these two states. So essentially, what happened is that people got scared. The anxiety level went up. And suddenly, everybody withdrew and everybody stayed at home and did some social distancing in, in March and April when things became very, very bad. Now, the second wave is very different. The second wave is a COVID, I call it, it's driven by COVID fatigue. People are tired of doing social distancing. And, uh, and it's more pronounced in Europe than in the US because in the US, there was never, there was a lockdown, but then it was never really lifted so well. While in Europe, you had a much stricter lockdown in the spring, and then it was totally in the summer, there was almost no lockdown at all. And suddenly you come back with a second lockdown. So you might argue there's an endowment effect. So I'm going here in behavioral economics, which is very enlightening uh, in this regard. So there's, you know, suddenly now you have, you went back to the lockdown no lockdown in the summer, and now you have to lock down again. So there's huge fatigue. But an alternative interpretation is, is an optimal expectations interpretation that some earlier work I did with Jonathan Park in 2005, where he said, how optimistic can you be about the situation? That depends a lot. Um, if, if you're very optimistic, you make decisions which you might regret in the future. So you, if you you can have beliefs and believe things are as well, and then you get anticipatory utility from that. So uh, I believe that I will win the lottery. I will be happy already today, even though I haven't gotten a lottery win at all, but I believe much more stronger on that. And then when the, the time comes and the lottery payment is not coming, I will actually be sad and have suffered from some regret and some negative utility at that point. And I balance the two things. So I would like to be happy today. I become a little bit optimistic, but if I'm too optimistic, I make a mistake because I decide I, I will win the lottery and I go out and buy a Porsche or whatever I want to buy. And then next period, I don't get the lottery win. And then I have the Porsche and this was actually a mistake because I can't afford it, okay? And that's sort of trade-off in the optimal expectations framework. And you can think of in the COVID setting, it applies here as well in a sense that, you know, I cannot, if you can be very optimistic, if you know that you can actually not change your behavior in the future anyway, because it's given by the government. So I can actually dream about things. The future behavior is driven primarily by government action. Okay. And if my danger in the future is not driven by my own action, but by the externalities from others, in both circumstances, I want to push aside the dangers of COVID and I have this COVID fatigue. So that's, but I think to, in order to understand some work, trying to understand this COVID fatigue, why we have this huge difference between the two uh, waves. And um, I think that's important to understand how people behave uh, in a particular way. Now, there's also this huge talk always about the health, wealth trade-off or life and livelihood trade-off. Okay, so I, I would argue it's, a, it's an illusionary uh, trade-off in advanced economies, but not in emerging and developing economies. So essentially the trade of in advanced economies is a dynamic one. If you lock down now, you of course, you will, the GDP will go down, but it also has an advantage that the GDP is not going down so much in the future because in the future, your health situation will be better. And hence you don't suffer so much about the future health uh, situation and in the future economic situation. So it's actually not a health wealth, it's a dynamic trade off between now versus later. I think that's the misconception which was often played out initially. And the behavior was not driven by the lockdown of the government, particularly in the first wave, but by the fear that people had. So even with the lockdown or not, people were afraid and didn't do much. Now in emerging economies, it's different, especially, you know, look here at India and other countries, uh, 
it was, do we do a lockdown in order to avoid a COVID death? But it, if we do that very forcefully, then we get starvation. So it's essentially, it, it's death versus death. So it's not death versus wealth, it's death versus death. And, uh, and then it, the power of accounting comes and the visibility of lives coming. So you had the COVID death counted in the news every day, but the people dying of starvation, you have not counted. And that's, uh, that's uh, you know, the power of accounting. And that's this famous saying, what is measured will be managed. So we measure essentially death from COVID death, but, you know, we don't measure all the starvation death. So that will be a distortion that we actually lock down too sharp, not internalizing what the externalities will be on the starvation and other death. I mean, there are, of course, people cannot go to the hospital anymore for other cancer treatments and uh, diabetes treatment and so forth. There will be additional death too. And that has to be a fine balance. But the fact that one is in the news and the other one is not in the news makes a huge difference. And of course, there are huge side effects from the lockdown as well. Let me just uh, give you one example. Of course, the COVID was brought in India in particular by the rich from abroad, was brought into the big cities through the airports. And then you had a lockdown and then some of the migrant workers got infected because they do all the services for the, the wealthy people. And then they had a lockdown and then the migrant workers were essentially they were not paid anymore. They had to go back to the villages and then they brought essentially the COVID to the villages in the countryside. So it started in the cities and then the lockdown itself had some side effects, some externalities, bringing it to the, to the villages. So you'll see what the dynamics is, how complicated this dynamics is once you take the behavioral aspects uh, into account. Now, another lesson, uh, you have to stop me if uh, I take too long. Uh, I, can I take another three minutes or so? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, um, great. Another lesson is that, of course, the cost of testing of vaccine and the vaccine developments are tiny compared to the lockdown. Okay, so the lockdown, the weekly cost in the US was about 80 billion. Uh, the world, it was estimated about 200 billion a week. Testing costs you almost nothing compared to that. And, uh, you know, the same is the vaccine. If you, even if you spend a billion, that's just, you know, a weekly cost of, of a lockdown is 200 billion. Of course, now we are better, we have a better idea how to lock down the economy, but, you know, it's still not working so well. The numbers are still high and it's really rising in the US, it's rising in Europe, it's rising everywhere. Um, and then the question is, how do you fund um, some vaccines? So what doesn't work, and that's, you know, some insight Larry Summers gave in May is that you give normal profit margins to these firms and if they fail, they don't get anything, they lost their money, well, that doesn't work. So one way to is to have some X price with excess, excess profit margins, uh, but there's a commitment problem that, you know, you promise this thing, but then you don't deliver at the end of the day. So essentially a better way is to ensure against failure. So moral hazard is not really <clears throat> the big issue is that, okay, if your vaccine doesn't work, we never let less paid and buy it from you. And then the question is, you know, how many vaccines do you want to develop in parallel? And here's the answer, essentially you want a lot of redundancies. You want to develop 14 something develop uh, vaccines in, simultaneously and then just you know, things which work, you take, and if they don't work, you throw it away, but you pay nevertheless, because the costs are tiny compared to the cost of the lockdown. And when you organize it as a social planner, you want to focus on vaccines which are fairly dissimilar. No? You want to have a negative correlation. Some will work, some will not work. So you would like to have some negative uh, correlation uh, between them. Now, let me say a few words about uh, the global economy. Um, so what's about globalization? How will COVID change globalization? That's another economic lesson. And of there's this argument out of globalization that the economy is actually, globalization will still be high, but it will not really go down. And so we, the focus so far was all about cost minimization. And that put a little bit uh, piggy bank here. That's, you know, saving some money. And, and I said earlier, the new focus is on resilience. Okay, so I'll put it differently. Uh, just in time in order to minimize the costs moves to just in case, as I think Roberto has a paper on this too. I think he has a paper which calls just in double case or something like that. Uh, 
But so essentially what you did earlier, you went to the countries which provided the cheapest supplier and it was one country. And I think what happens in the future, you will what's referred to as dual sourcing or triple sourcing. Now you will actually say, I, I'm sitting here in the US, I need some input. And for this input, I, in the olden days, I just went to the country with the cheapest price, with the cheapest uh, inputs. Now I actually have three competing suppliers from ideally three different continents. And of course, China is here as well and Latin America more generally. And, and then I say, okay, I have you know, one supplier from Latin America, one from Africa and one from Southeast Asia. And uh, this way I can hedge my risk. And I think there will be a shift to that. Of course, it also means there will be less bargaining because these three suppliers in normal times will uh, uh, compete against themselves, but there's a huge need out than this from dual sourcing, I think. And that will be more important, probably more important than reshoring, okay? Because there will be reshoring from because of new technology, making it cheaper to produce it in the advanced economies. But I think this um, uh, dual sourcing will be the more important component, it's just my gut feeling. And if you know, there needs some studies need to be done here on this dimension, but it's important to understand uh, then for companies, you know, how should I position myself? And should I be worried that there's another supplier in, in Vietnam or somewhere? I'd say no, because companies will actually also would like to have somebody from Latin America. But of course you will be competing in normal times. So how big powers compete? So one big thing in globalization, of course, the big elephant in the room is China versus US, okay? So the China and US, so I've written an earlier paper on China versus US and what we can we learn from the earlier competition between Imperial Germany, so late 19th century, early 20th century and the UK. It was the same and it was surprising how similar the competition was. So Germany was the China today and, and, and UK was uh, the US today, okay? And then, uh, so, and you can see how these great powers compete economically. Of course, it led to the first world war. And, um, but one thing they competed on is on the global infrastructure. So you project power through global infrastructure investments. And uh, you, you, everybody's familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative, but you might not have heard that Germany had the same thing it was landlocked a little bit, not China is not landlocked, but there's only one coast, but it was building a railroad from Berlin to Baghdad. And if you go to Istanbul, you still see the train stations. I mean, it, it was a major project. It was the same idea as the Belt and Road Initiative to get strategic geopolitical connections or to oil and all the other things. And that's, you know, and trade and so forth. And the Ottoman Empire at that time was in alliance with the, uh, with Germany, so there was this, in the railroads, you still see it. It's still there and it's still operating to a large extent. And, and the technology at that time were railroads uh, what compared what we have the technology now. So it's the same thing. You see the same thing competing with finance. You see the famous, there were big financial developments, German banks financing foreign investments. Same thing is going on uh, at the same uh, time too. Right now, there's a lot of weaponization of the dollar. So US is using the dollar very strategically in order to get foreign policy geopolitical influence. Uh, with the digital money revolution, there will be a digital remember it was just established, uh, will try to get uh, a hold of Latin America and others. And, and Libra is doing the same thing. So it's coming from all sides. So there is competition on that side. And uh, you know, Latin America has to think which side uh, it will be more exposed to. And a big part of the international competition will be standard setting. You know, if you think about it, setting in the new technologies, who is setting the standard is really important. It gives your industry a huge advantage. So think about mobile phones. US was not able to agree on a joint mobile phone standard. Europe agreed on a GSM standard and then it became the global standard and Nokia and uh, was actually one of the leading mobile phone companies because this huge global standard, it had a huge advantage until smartphones came and they were not able to switch to the smartphone environment. But you know, the same thing is 5G, who is determining the standard? That's will be a huge strategic advantage uh, in terms of trade. It's more important than any, you know, customs here, custom there. I mean, that's just uh, peanuts compared to setting the right standards. <clears throat> 
And then there will be, you know, digital borders. And that comes a little bit, you know, what I've coined as what the, was it mentioned earlier, a digital currency union. There will be new currencies floating, you know, but there will be in a digital space on certain platforms. Uh, I don't have time to go into that, but there will be digital borders which will be driven by privacy considerations. There will be privacy regulation like in Europe of the GPDR, and that will determine what, what is a, what is a, you, uh, a economic area you know? and privacy will be so important because the digital space becomes the, the new space we do economics and privacy will be the big component on that. So that's on the, on the global side. So we have the globalization, we have the dual sourcing and we have you know, the big two powers competing uh, with that. And then we have um, also the financial macro, macro finance side and how do we deal with that? And then the global financial crisis, I just want to allude to uh, what happened in March, 2020 uh, where we had the flight to safety into the dollar and that affects all emerging economies to a large extent. And here's just a picture where you see, you know, comparing in billions of dollars, the outflow from an emerging market economies during the stress periods. And you can see the COVID crisis was way more dramatic than any other crisis. So you have the taper tantrum, which is this uh, pink line. You have the global financial crisis. They're all way less dramatic. Of course, this starts end of January. These are the number of days. So you go early March and then in March 22nd and other things defected you know, saved essentially the global financial system by essentially allowing, uh, by cutting the interest rate really stabilized, we would be in a totally different world without the Fed intervening this way. Uh, and then allowing repo, the repo facilities for foreigners to repo US treasuries. There was a run on repos, on 10 year repos, which you, you know, it's unimaginable that even the repo market would break down uh, the 10 year US treasury repo. And so that actually, had, huge stabilizing effect. So I should actually update this figure and it, it goes back. No, it was totally stabilizing uh, at that time, but it was a very critical moment and people underestimate, I mean, they forget how critical this moment was and uh, what uh, element um, it is. So that's about global uh, financial, uh, financial aspects on the global side. And we will have to think about uh, the global safe asset again. And I come back to my gloss piece, or as Jose mentioned, the S piece initially, I've done the same thing. We talked about this. I remember this in Chile when I visited Jose um, some years back and we talked about the, the global safe asset, the global, uh, in order to stabilize the global financial system in the light of global financial crisis. Here and this time around, the Fed did it because they did the right things very, very quickly. Now, the, another big problem will be the huge fiscal debt situation. Okay, how do we deal with this huge amount of debt? What's the fiscal space we are having? And you know, here's just a picture, you know, World War II, and that's where we are. That's where we are going. You know, go, what will be the long run debt to GDP ratio? And will debt to GDP even be the right measure? Should we actually measure, uh, you know, not the, the fiscal burden rather than the level of debt? Should it be the interest payment we have to pay relative? to GDP and that's essentially what the fiscal burden is. But I would argue and I've pushed this forward also again at the ACP to look at the value at risk of interest burden to GDP. Okay, so how easily can it spike up the interest burden? Because so we have to have a risk as a component to that because if we go in particular for Latin American countries, the interest rate might suddenly spike and we have to be aware of that and we have to take this into account in our resilience analysis. Of course, if the interest rate spikes and we have measures in place that we come back and the mean reverts very easily, then it's not an issue. But that's essentially uh, very, very important to keep in mind. So finally, uh, another trap risk analysis. So as I mentioned, we only, not only have to look at tail risk, but also trap risk. What is the trap risk? You have a, you have a, a, a sharp event. And then you're trapped, you don't get back. There's no resilience, okay? And that's what's a trap is com in contrast to, to Taylor. So I'm putting this forward, this trap risk analysis. And uh, one thing is, what is one Taylor risk? It's a low probability. It's not, I mean, nobody's, nobody's radar screen is what I call the inflation whipsaw. Okay, so what's an inflation whipsaw essentially is that at the moment, there are huge deflationary pressures. 
And you know, the central bank has to intervene a lot in order to keep inflation roughly at zero to make sure that we don't go highly negative in inflation. But in the future, it might be that we go back to inflation and quite dramatically, and what are the different forces? So I've worked on with Sebastian Merkel, uh, who is on the market this year, Jonathan Parker and Yuli Sanikov, we have a paper on saying, try, let's try to understand the different forces for inflation and deflation. And one important force is, of course, risk. At the moment, we have so much risk out there, people are scared. And that means if you have a lot of risk, idiosyncratic risk and other risk, people want to hold safe assets. So you can easily issue government bonds. You can easily issue money. What's money in the first place? Money is essentially just a government bond with infinite maturity, but floating interest rate. That's what reserves are. And so that's, you know, if the risk goes up, it leads to, that's a minus sign here, it leads to lower inflation, i.e. deflationary pressure. So the risk is so high that everybody says, okay, I want to get out of risky stuff. I go into some, and I have additional saving. And then as of, on top of it, there's forced savings that you cannot go to restaurants, you cannot do anything. But once the vaccine is there and everything is there, what happens then? Uh, is there some pent up demand? Will people say, oh, finally, I can go traveling again. I finally can do this. And there might be, you know, excess demand. And if there's, you know, many firms went bankrupt and the supply is not there, perhaps then there's inflation. And we can also have redistributive things. So we analyze in this paper, what happens if there's more redistribution from the contact intensive sector to the less contact uh, intensive sector. You see that this also creates some inflationary pressure down the road. Okay, and there are many, many, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, aspects to see, you know, there's, there's a, at least a tail risk you should not ignore. And that might be even a trap, an inflation trap, because you cannot lean against it anymore. Because if you were to hike interest rates, you ruin certain countries' fiscal situation. You know? If you think about Europe, and that's why I proposed this trap analysis for the secondary monetary pillar at the ECB. And so that's one thing. And then perhaps I can mention one thing probably Roberto will like. Uh, it's one of my favorite innovations. And so you might say, okay, this COVID analysis, it leads to a COVID situation leads to a lot of, you know, uh, scarring effects, a lot of negative things, but also some neg positive things. And I, I link this to the QWERTY problem. It's one of my favorite uh, problems. Uh, it's like, you know, people are very reluctant to cannibalize them, their own firms and start a new thing, but the QWERTY problem, and I guess most of the listeners might have heard about it, it's, you know, why the keyboard in our keyboards is assigned along to this QWERTY keyboards? It's assigned because in the old typewriters that the hammers don't smash into each other. Yeah. So the keys were assigned in such a way that minimize the probability that the two hammers smash into each other. But we don't have old typewriters anymore, but we still have the same keyboard. And you see how resilient certain structures are. It's very hard to throw you out of that. And the COVID crisis is a shock which can throw us out of it. I mean, of course, the keyboard, I don't think it will throw out the keyboard, but it has many effects. If you just think about all the regulatory shackles we have in terms of telemedicine, it was not allowed suddenly, oof, everything is possible uh, to do everything in telemedicine. It would have been impossible just a year ago to imagine that regulators would go along with that. Home office, we jump from one equilibrium to another equilibrium. This might have a whole different structure for real estate prices, might change traffic patterns. So there's a lot of interesting stuff coming up and Nick Bloom will talk next Thursday about home office in the uh, webinar series I'm organizing. But anyway, so we all know we all teach online and uh, we will live much more in a digital world uh, compared to what we did before. So let me stop here because I think I ran over time. Of course, I have no, some no, more slides. <laughs> no, uh, let me stop here. Thanks again for giving me no, this no, Marcus, Thank you so much. We'll Very say, fascinating uh, discussion, uh, Marcus. I, 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 I want to start with, a, I think that was quite interesting and and how you start from this idea that's not coming from finance, it's your ideas about the more political science and, and the social contract. I, I became kind of concerned because you were listing things that should help and should not help to the social contract. So I was thinking about countries and, and polarization. For example, you like diversity, 
and you like diversity because it makes you more resilient. That helps for large countries. But then large countries are more heterogeneous, ethnically, for example, not the case of Japan, perhaps. Yes, yes. And that reduces all this idea of sense of community. So I, I think that it's, a, it, it's quite a, 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 the kind of the, the consideration that you need for different kinds of a, 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 a background to have a town social contract are quite a, 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 a conflicting across countries. So you don't want to be small, but you, you want you want some homogeneity, but you don't want excessive homogeneity because of the bicycle. You don't want to be thrown by wind from just one side. So I don't know how you square this. So I totally agree with you, though. It's uh, let me put it this way: there might, it's a social contract is not homogeneous across a country, so it's different from country to country. And the social contract can be more pronounced for subgroups in the country as well. And that's, you know, when you have a federal structure. So you might have a bigger countries and then you have some states in the country and then the social contract within uh, the state is more pronounced. Or you might have uh, certain international agreements which help out uh, in times of crisis where they said, oh, we have some common, let me just give you an hypothetical example. Uh, in Latin America, there's probably some common uh, feeling that we all together Latin Americans. And there's, you know, have a common trade area and you can have other arrangements if something happens uh, to help each other out. So there is, of course, a social contract and is also a common sense of belonging together across Latin American countries, which might be closer than, you know, from Latin American to some Asian countries. Uh, and that's, so it's not something which has to be legal or it's something it's just there, but it can be built. So of course it's a slow building process over decades to form a common identity and a sense of community. And, and it can be for subgroups much more pronounced and for broader areas less pronounced. So it doesn't need to be uh, the same social contract across the country, uh, in particular if you allow some from federal structures, but it's, it's a very good point. Uh, in fact, they're just building on that. Uh, oh, by, by, by the way, the, the paper is called Just in Worst Case. It's uh, with two students, and one of them is oh, okay. from Orphe, Princeton there. Yeah. <laughs> so Daniel Rigobon, actually. So, so okay, yes. oh, uh, I see. Yeah, it's, it's about robustness, which is very closely okay. related to, to your okay. notion of resilience. Um, no, I, I was thinking about actually what you say is, uh, a, this, is this sense of belonging is a very important one. Actually, the society is the way they talk about different issues. So when we're playing in the World Cup, we are all us. I mean, it really doesn't matter the size of the country. We, this, I mean, like, think about it. It doesn't matter ethnicity, we're all us. And therefore that day you have massive amount of solidarity and we but, all have- but, but Within a country, not the continent. No? Exactly, within a country, exactly within a country. <laughs> and so, so within the country, we are all us. But when we're talking about unemployment, then, then people will refer about the unemployed differently. So them, I mean, so, so I am working, you're not. So, so that sense of solidarity also uh, within the countries, that sense of belonging and, and uh, that, that these social norms, I, I agree with you, they have to be built. I mean, we have the capacity. I always say like, we do have the capacity to have a lot of solidarity in, in, in the event of a natural disaster, we're incredibly generous. Mm. But in the case of a financial crisis, we might be less. And so, so, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about the US now here. So, so you, you're right, these are, these are things that can be built and, and, and a lot of how we talk about the issues. So if we, if we constantly are thinking about moral hazard and that people are abusing the system, that the people that are in misery are there almost by choice, it's very difficult to have a conversation in which you will have solidarity. So, so let me just give you perhaps one thing triggered. You know, Nelson Mandela tried very hard to, to build a more homogeneous society, build a stronger social contract, and he used rugby. You know? So I think exactly. sports is a very powerful instrument to build a closer sense of belonging together. But just to. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a non controversial issue. The national team is a non controversial issue. <laughs> but of course, it. It makes perhaps, or perhaps you correct me, if people believe very strong in their own national team, you also have less of a Latin American community because you're more 
you know, that it goes in both directions to some extent. You also distance yourself from other yeah. enablers. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I was referring mostly about the country itself. Yeah. But yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. And you there is another very important point that I, I have been seeing a lot of analysts and many people writing about this, and, and which is true. In this crisis, we need much more state. There's much more externalities. We need much more control. And, and now you raise a very interesting point that say, after the COVID crisis, we'll go back to a more open society. Where will it be? Because there is this tension of, I, I, I guess the optimal will move back to more open society. But there is so much, uh, I would say, so much uh, force on the, on the idea that we need more state that then people that think that there is more state will win a lot of space to make the point that, that we need more state now and, and forever. Your point is much more depending on circumstances and, and that's a pragmatic thing to go. But, but there is this issue, you see everywhere people writing about, we need more state, this, this, this crisis demonstrated that we need more state that we have forgotten the role of the state. So after the crisis, we, we will have to have more state, which is not a, 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 an obvious conclusion according to your discussion. Yeah, I think right now we need more state because there's huge health health externalities, but then it will go away again and then we have to go back to, and there's this big danger that uh, we will not go back. Of course, there are certain things which the Warren Buffett's naked swimmer moment, he called it this way, where we said, okay, oh, there is a fundamental problem there and this we have to solve in the long run. So the state has to be involved in that as well. But I'm, I'm, I'm also arguing that state is only one aspect to it and it's also very limiting because everything has to come with enforcement and loss of privacy. And we might not want that and perhaps social norms can substitute for the state to a certain degree and there might be better in certain areas. Uh, you know, it's, it's striking to me how the social norms are different within the United States, whether you wear a mask here in Princeton or you wear it in, in some other, uh, other states of the United States is very, very different. The social norms are so different. If you don't wear a mask here in Princeton, people look at you and say, what's going on with this guy? And this is a very powerful force. It's way more powerful than the police uh, giving me tickets yeah. because the neighbor says, this guy, you can't talk to him. He's not one of us. He's just not behaving well. That's way more powerful than the police giving me a ticket of you have to pay $100 now. Uh, so that's, I think, we have to have a debate. And I think economics is not focusing on this social norm aspects at all or very limited. Okay, let's put it this way. Of course, some people have worked on that and there's a work on behavioral economics and all this. But I think we have to integrate this somehow uh, in our thinking as well. Yeah, there's some work from uh, Akerlof on, um, on yes. moral psychology, which is uh, more or less what you are describing. Yes. Yeah, so it's... Uh, um, I, 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 I wanted to, to talk to you about the difference of the COVID fatigue and the fear. So, so if, if I take the COVID fatigue, uh, which I, I believe that people are tired of, uh, of, of, uh, of COVID. So that means that uh, the second wave will be far more harmful than the first one, don't you think? Because, oh, okay, is that, I just wanted to get your-, your No, there are, two, there are two elements to it. The second wave was in the Spanish flu was also way more, way more pronounced than the first wave in 1918. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other is of course, in terms of medical advancements, we have now a much better understanding how to deal with that. And when, you know, when I talked to Ben Tolmstrom the other day, he told me that the biggest advancement how to deal with COVID is uh, sick people is to force them to lie on their belly. You know? yeah. So when you sleep, that was a big breakthrough in a sense. It's not a vaccine, it's not something, it makes a huge difference about your survival probability, where, how you sleep and how you, which direction you lie. And so we learn and the medical profession is learning and that makes of course uh, the second wave less dangerous and might also explain why people are less careful because you know, actually now we know how to figure things out. Um, but but I, I agree with you that the fatigue will actually lead to much less careful behavior and might make things worse. That's one force. The other force is that we have a better medical treatment already now. 
That's, so, so yes, there would be less death, but it might lead to more people uh, suffering from the, from the virus. That's, that's yes. how, so, so, now, now yeah. regarding the virus and the vaccine, and, and, and when you start describing the different ways to promote the vaccine, how do you see this? Because you say first you do it for profit and you do so gain them that you have some insurance. Now it seems that we have the vaccine and we may have three vaccines right now, uh, which, and, and, and which are also quite effective beyond the discussion of AstraZeneca, but, but they, they are quite effective. So my, my also general impression is that the vaccine with this effectiveness is ahead of what we on average thought. So we, we, may, we may have vaccination before. So, so how do you see your discussion of vaccine of, of optimal, uh, let's say, optimal vaccine uh, uh, incentive compared to what, who, what happened actually in, in the crisis, in the COVID crisis? So there are two things. So let me talk about two different aspects. One is the vaccine development and one is the vaccine distribution. I didn't talk about the, the vaccine distribution, which you have a whole section on this too. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the vaccine development, I think it, it, it went well. I mean, the US government actually was, instead of focusing on testing or you know, mask wearing or anything, it focused totally, it was betting totally on vaccines, you know, vaccine development, it put a lot of money behind that. How it was handled internationally, that's a different question, but in terms of getting things done, um, it's also, it's also uh, if you, for example, look at this BioNTech in Germany, that's a German company, the CEO of the company, he, de he already in January decided to bet his company pretty much on developing this vaccine. Or that's, it probably was, I'm not sure whether it was a smart financial decision at this stage, because it wasn't clear at all whether it will be a, become a pandemic or not. In January already, he came back from his vacation early and said, okay, I will move the whole company, my 1500 people to develop a vaccine against the coronavirus. And that was a big bet. And you see that people are not only motivated by profit, but they're also motivated to, to help human mankind. So there is, you know, Tom Hobbs, Thomas Hobbs is not really right that we only this homo economicus. I think we also have some social angle as well. And there's some in innovators who this, and I think in general, of course, I'm a big fan of innovators. I think that's what drives the world and our human mankind. Uh, and we have to stimulate that and have to say that. And overall, I think it went pretty fast. It was unprecedented that we could develop three vaccines already now. And this, that's one thing. The other thing is how to distribute it. <clears throat> and of course, I, I would also give it first to the medical professionals and, and all this to the elderly. But there has to be, it's not obvious how the, you can write down a model uh, and there's not obvious how you give it. Do you give it to the most vulnerable ones or do you give it to the multi-spreaders? So whenever there is an externality, you can protect the receiver of the externality. You can, you can just make sure that the externality is not spread in the first place. And so I played around with Yuli a little bit on some of these models. How would you model that? And it's, it depends very much on parameters, how you do it or whether you actually, you might say, okay, I give it to the multi-spreaders and I bring my R0 below one and then this whole thing will die out on the, on the, the most effective way. First, give it to the medical profession, of course, but then I give it to the multi-spreaders and then, they, then essentially uh, I can distribute it this way, give it to the multi-spreaders and then the, the, the thing will die out because R0 is below one or I give it to the most vulnerable, to the elderly well, alternatively, I give it to the guys who contribute more to the most to the economy. You know, they said, "Oh, they can go back to work, and I can stabilize the economy." So these are all trade-offs. And uh, in Germany, there was an ethic commission to think about this: how to distribute this, and they came up with some list. But they didn't emphasize this multi-spreader aspect so yeah. much. So, sorry for my ignorance. Uh, uh, yeah, but we can know who are the vulnerable, the, the elderly, or the most important workers. But do we know who are the multi-spreaders? Can we distinguish in order to? Teach. Yeah, in, in a sense, sorry. School Roberto. teachers, for example, will be multi-spreaders and kids, yeah. Yeah, so there's a controversy on the school but teachers. Multi-spreaders are multi-contact people, we say. I would say that's not because of a internal characteristics rather than 
no. yeah, it's it's probably some professions where you interact a lot with people. So okay. we can do online teaching. Uh, so we're not multi spreaders in a sense. So it's fairly okay. nice right. to switch. But you know, if you I don't know certain professions where you meet thousand people a day every day, <laughs> you probably should be vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah, okay, like, like all economic papers, it depends on the assumptions. So if we want uh, the uh, college teachers to be uh, uh, vaccine first, we can write a model in 10 seconds. Our incentives are totally yeah. aligned. No, no, what, what I refer is, is about the primary and secondary school, the, the food uh, uh, supply chain, uh, all the utilities. Um, uh, plumbers, these are professions and tasks that have that depend a lot on contact, and we need yeah, the, child of, care. The, of the cashier in the supermarket. No, it needs the cashier exactly always somebody uh, all day long. And I often think, oh my God, these guys are really exposed. No? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, they are terribly exposed, terribly, terribly exposed. Yes. And so there are some. Um, yeah, thank you so much. We we, uh, we have taken uh, more time uh, oh, than, than the allocated one. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the book before we end? So you you said that you your your some idea when you will get this book. So I I'm working full force on it. I'm trying to get it out uh, as soon as possible. Um, yeah, I don't I haven't decided yet how to, but I will distribute it as widely as cheaply as possible as soon as po I mean I have a dream which is I have it for for Christmas for people to give it as a Christmas present, but that's very. Okay. Um, Ambitious, let's put it this way. We'll do it. Yeah, we'll do it. Let, let us know because uh, I, I actually think that this is um, concentrating on the lessons. Yeah, we, yeah, and concentrating on the lessons, we, we might actually uh, make good policy decisions uh, next year. And we really need good policies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so Marcos, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for taking time on, on this special day to be here uh, with all of us. Uh, so on Thanksgiving, you're giving us uh, a lot of uh, reasons to be thankful. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, again, on behalf of uh, MIT, and, and let, me, let me give the uh, time to Jose also to thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your commitment. Uh, all your webinars have been incredibly uh, important for all of us uh, that work in, um, in this area, so I hope that uh, that you keep up uh, the good work, and yeah, and, and I hope that we end with only 19 lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want more disasters. Well, right I now, I have more than 19, uh, but I had I had this idea. I started out and I only had 12, and then I said, okay, the, the remaining ones is I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now I have more and more. Yeah. So. It has been great seeing you. Well, not personally, just uh, yes. from the screen, but it has been great seeing you. We have learned a lot, and, and it has been an amazing presentation. I think that people will sure will try to look at your book and also at your PowerPoint. And I think that thank you very much, and have a great turkey today. Yeah. So, Thanks. I uh, will have you too. Thank you. Or if you have thank one, you. but thank you. Prepared the thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. It was good to see you again uh, virtually and hope to see you soon in the real world. Yeah. Okay, hope good to see you. Future. Take care, stay safe. Oh, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.